think, I think, Patrick, for most of the audience, you need very little introduction. I was just saying that you are the expert's expert when it comes to complications and people come and ask you stuff from all over the world about the most horrific complications that can be imagined. And you're based in London, you lecture world, worldwide on this. And so this is a rare chance to grab your expertise for people online. So, okay. I mean, could, could, we, could we start by, I mean, could, could you tell us a bit about how you became so specialised in complications in the first place? Um, I suppose if we look back at the, <clears throat> at the turn of the last century, in 1997, 96, Fillers came out for the first time in Europe. Um, they had collagen in the United States. Then IPL came out and then Botox. All at that same time, just before the turn of the century. So myself and some other people like um, Patrick Bowler in London, I suppose, started putting um, them all together to form aesthetic surgeries for the first time ever. So some people look at me, Des Fernandes, for instance, in South Africa, said, you're one of the five people that started this and he wanted to bring us all together once in South Africa. So I only mention that from the point of view that we had no designated protocols to deal with problems. Okay. And, um, so we had to deal with them ourselves. So the first problems that we started seeing coming through were HIV. Um, patients suffering from lipodystrophy. And as a consequence, they were suicidal. Um, the tablets we discovered later um, were causing um, the removal of all the fat from their faces. And I only mention this because in 1999-2000, we still didn't know whether it was because people were living longer that they uh, were developing this as a consequence of phase three AIDS or whether it was the tablets. Myself and some other people suspect it was the tablets because particularly I work in Africa with HIV and I never seen it there. And wow. then as a consequence of that, yeah, when Bono gave Alex de Catino the um, big United Nations Prize in 2003, and I, I was at that with him in the shirt in New York, uh, Alex Catino had treated all these patients, but he'd never treated anyone with medicines. You know what I mean? So I went down to Uganda and I seen these people don't have it. And I suspected that it was the antiretroviral drugs as it was. Now, I mentioned it because we were the first people to really do cheek augmentation. And some of these patients required between three and up to 20 mils of fillers in their face. Now, before that, they were using some Sculptra. It needed five yeah. different treatments. The big problem was that the, the chance of needle stick was very high because you do about 100 injections five times, you know, so, and these people were all HIV positive and you couldn't really trust the CD4 levels because people were still dying from it then. The new drugs are fine and it was a different world 20 years ago. And um, so we had to work out the way how to inject their faces safely to miss the transverse facial artery, to miss the infraorbital um, arteries and nerves, and to miss the iller. So uh, the way we had done the upper outer, almost like a, on a deltaal area, was pretty much the same thing. So like I did 45 HIV patients. I um, had that in the Journal of Derm Surgery. And um, it was wonderful because one treatment solved the problems, but at the time, um, I remember a very famous New York doctor, who wrote his obituary, Frederick Brandt, um, yes. had contacted me regarding how we were doing faces. And that's gone back nearly 20 years ago because wow. we moved them from doing bioalchemate to using Radies. And um, from Radies to obviously using the longer acting hyaluronic reversible type fillers. So we were filling faces, I suppose, before cheek augmentation became popular. Um, Fantastic. Okay, okay. And so you're, you, you're just sort of ahead of that, but then it's all, it's all developed so much. Or I, well, it, then it, many it other seems... things happened. In 2001, uh, at the face conference, um, a doctor approached me and said, Patrick, I have a patient who has got a lid ptosis, and we went to see the patient in London, and that was the first use of iodipine that I'm aware of. And, okay. um and actually, we used phenylephedrine, and um, she got a, an immediate result. And later, believe it or not, another colleague of mine in London, a classic surgeon, asked me 
to travel to a Middle Eastern country to see a very famous uh, person who had a full ptosis and we couldn't correct her. She remained like that um, for four and a half months. Very uh, famous princess involved in charity work. So it was those, I suppose, times originally from conferences and starting to talk about, um, I suppose, complications. People started yeah. opening out and giving you the thing. Now, originally, not, in 2007, 2008, people did not want to talk about complications. It was only in 2011 that they came to the fore and I couldn't get them to discuss it at conferences either. So the way I got across it was originally in Las Vegas in the 2011 Congress, I turned around and I said, what we should do is take five doctors that are very prominent that are not embarrassed to talk about their own complications. So we had what we called a make culpa session. So we set up, this is what happened to me, how would you treat it? This is how I treat it. And once that had broke the back, we then did that in Monaco, in um, Catherine's um, Monaco Congress. And then as a consequence, the companies were willing to come out. But believe it or not, in 2006, when Arnie Klein put too much fillers into Michael Jackson's face and he had to come across the Atlantic, I phoned up QMED and they had no means of taking it out. And I remember uh -huh. speaking to Boris in a taxi <clears throat> he was traveling through Moscow at the time, and I said, look, if, if this was a child coming to a casualty with a poison, you'd have to have a protocol for working it out. It's yeah. your product. You know how yeah. do you remove it? So, um, we, we started removing, not so much for vascular occlusions then, but um, setting the protocols for removal of hyaluronic acid. And we, um, as a consequence, uh, then vascular occlusion started appearing and we worked out the protocols for that. Wow. Um, okay, because could you, could you talk briefly just to sort of say what we're talking about when, when we say complications with A, with injectables and B, with threads, sort of from, from the basic to the serious, because obviously there's minor things like bruising, which are a ha hazard of this. Um, but then, I mean, it's vascular occlusions that are the big problem in- Sure, okay, in well, I suppose regarding injectables, they tend to fit into a couple of different categories. One is inflammatory, one is infectious, and one is obviously vascular occlusions. Okay. <clears throat> in terms of vascular occlusions, I suppose most people are interested in that. Um, most people follow Claudia de Lorenzo's paper at the moment on it, and I have no problem with that, but I do take umbrage of the fact that I presented that paper myself six years oh. before publication in 2011. Oh. And um, I had some disagreements at the time as to, um, we shouldn't be using it at that. So Claudio, as you know, and I give him credit, wrote that paper, I suppose, in um, the Aesthetic Surgery Journal in um, 2017. Um, but we were advocating 750 twice a day back 10 years ago, almost, for okay. vascular surgeons. And if anybody wants to get that paper, uh, it's by Claudio Lorenzo, and it's um, the July and August 2017 edition um, yeah. of the aesthetic journal, and it's uh, high dose hyaluronidase. Um, so in terms of what Claudio has said in that paper, and I would totally agree with, if you yeah. get a, a, a vascular occlusion, the protocol would say that what you should do is use up to 1,500 units of hyaluronidase per hour until you get, I suppose, um, capillary refill or loss of um, the uh, reticular structures, libido, and um, you should try and get your capillary refill time back to, it'd be nice to get it back to two seconds, but I've seen some of them on recovery that are still sitting at four or five. So okay. I suppose that's an important one. In terms of vascular occlusions also, things have changed, I suppose, quite a bit recently. The first thing is that the use of um, nitroglycerin paste has almost been stopped now. Originally it was stopped by the Japanese, but more recently, Kerry, Cohen and Krauss in the Journal of Derma Surgery in J January, just before COVID, uh, wrote a paper in terms of how to treat impending um, filler necrosis, and they had said not to do it. <clears throat> the reason being yeah. that it can set up paradoxical vasodilation and form and allow the embolus to form down the line. <clears throat> I must say I use oral nitrates. I tend to use Cialis um, 
it works for two days. It works at night time. You don't have to be putting something on somebody's face. I still use it. I've treated, um, I think, 96 cases like that without a trouble. And um, no, do I have evidence that it works? Not really, except my patients all recovered. Is there That's any good. difference in using topical and uh, oral? I would say from a pharmacological point of view, they probably both are the same. Um, I suppose there isn't enough research done, but I still would advocate the use of Cialis because you can walk away, it's working at night time, it'll work for 48 hours. <clears throat> I tend to still use hyperbaric oxygen and I've got some wonderful results with that. I wouldn't use it in everybody. If somebody would have- And sorry, Patrick, process. to stop you. Sorry to interrupt you, but how do you, how do you use the hyperbaric oxygen? Can you explain that for people who might not know? <clears throat> sure, okay, well, you can run it at different concentrations. Probably we start off at 75% rather than 100%. Some people, particularly in wintertime, could go in with fluid in their ears and you could blow their eardrums. <clears throat> hyperbaric oxygen is very cheap. It's in every city in Britain and Ireland. And um, I, we use it for divers all the time. Plastic surgeons use it for flaps that are um, uh, compromised from a vascular point of view. And it's very cheap. It's only about 50 euros, 50 quid, you know, for an hour. <clears throat> Normally, I would run it at 75 for two or three days and then put it up to 100%. I think the results are astounding. I okay. would see patients coming back the next day different. So it makes total logical sense. If you can drive oxygen into tissues that are being deprived of it, then obviously you're going to um, give them a lifeline. There's no doubt about that. Um, in terms of, I suppose, um, some of the other things, aspirin. Aspirin is still out there. Um, yeah. I, I sit on the fence on aspirin. We know it's an embolus you're dealing with. It's not a thrombus. So in theory, you shouldn't really be using aspirin because it could contribute to bruising, whatever. But there's no pa research papers on it. And probably there's more benefit to be gained from using aspirin than not. I mean, the logic okay. is if you've got stasis of blood with an embolus, then you could get platelet aggregation. And as a consequence, possibly it would make the embolus worse. And if anything, it would reduce uh, inflammation. I must say, I don't tend to use it normally myself, but if somebody put it to me, do you, should you use it or not? I'd waver a bit, maybe yes, but um, okay. I don't personally use it. Okay, thanks. Now, cause... In terms of vascular occlusion of blindness, I know that a lot of people are interested in that. Yeah. <clears throat> I've had a protocol for that for a long time, and I've treated two patients. Um, I don't want to take credit for restoring their sight because one of them was going to restore their sight anyway, but I used it. I've always advocated the superorbital artery is very easy to palpate. It, we use it every day during um, laser resurfacing. You can feel the little foramen. And obviously, in my mind, if you shoot some how you run this there, it's going to go straight back into the retinal artery. I know everybody sort of says go retroverbal, but that's quite a distance away from the, the phthalmic or, or the retinal arteries. And even if you're afraid that you might nick the um, vessel, you, you'll not with a Botox needle. But even if you were to put a, a bleb of hyaluronidase in front of it, just sort of um, subdermal, it'll make its way probably back. Okay. Now, there's been a couple of patients I did some webinars in Russia, virtual ones, and Georgia during the lockdown. And believe it or not, um, I didn't realize until recently, there's been actually a, a quite a number of patients now that have had their sight restored by using this technique. You know, oh, that's um, good. Yeah. And how, how, I mean, the thing is, everybody is uh, aware of that as the kind of the worst possible outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and but ha and how how often does it occur? And presumably, it's it's happening more often now than it's it used to. Be. I think it's not point not one percent. Okay. The situation is this: everybody who's doing derma fillers has got hyaluronidase. I cannot think of yeah. anybody who doesn't. Beauticians are now getting it in from Spain as a chemical treatment for doing cellulite. <clears throat> so. Everybody has it, whether we like okay. them doing it or not. <clears throat> it's very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, common everywhere. Now, 
<clears throat> a bit of frog in my throat. Sorry for this. No worries, no worries. I was, I was going to ask as, as well about, I mean, particularly in the UK, a major part of the problem is that, no, uh, you, you know, you anyone can go and... Sorry, Alice, yeah. Just let me get back to this. You've yes, got a please. situation where you've got a patient who's losing their sight. Okay, what do you do? I mean, a lot of the protocols is phone 999, get an ambulance to go to the hospital. I would think seriously about doing that. The first thing is all the patients that have been sent to Murfields that didn't do anything with them, and that's two or three that I'm aware of. The second thing is the time that's going to take there is maybe London traffic, what, 25 minutes, 30 minutes? <laughs> You've been hiding around this. It's a simple thing, you know, sort of feel the little thing and inject in probably 1,500 units back in there. You'll do more in that small window because the clock is ticking. The patient's going to lose their eye. You're going to do you no harm. And even if you did harm, what are you going to do? The person's going yeah. to lose their eyesight. So I'm not advocating that 999 shouldn't be called, but I think it should be two or three or maybe four down the list. You should try and fix the problem yourself. It's your patient. They're yeah. going to lose their and, eyesight, you know, and you yeah. should be prepared to do it. Now, I know everybody's afraid to go in retrovulvar, and I don't blame you. It's a dangerous technique. You have to learn how to do it. You need special instruments. And it doesn't work anyway. There's no evidence that people have reversed that I'm aware of. This is very simple. You can feel the hole with your finger and you just put a bleb above it or shoot down the, the little hole because obviously the artery is bringing blood out the other way. So, yeah, yeah. And but to your point about that you've made years before about how can a company provide a product and not provide the antidote for when it goes, should it go wrong? Um, you know, the, the trouble I find as well with people who've had just um, occlusions more often around the, the lips from un unqualified practitioners, they will be sent to A&E, but A&E staff aren't trained in aesthetic complications. So, Incredible. you know. I, I pulled the HSE in Ireland on two occasions. I showed them nine cases of vascular occlusion in lips that went to the hospital and were sent home on steroids and told that an allergic reaction in most of the cases. Oh, yeah. One of them I've seen was eight, nine days long. They'd been to the GP, they'd been to a and &E, they'd been to a plastic surgeon, and they all were sent home and nothing was done. A hospital has hyaluronidase there for their ophthalmic surgeons. They probably yeah. don't want to take the responsibility on board, but I think it's so common at this stage. I had one hospital that turned around and I phoned them up but it, it was a patient that I seen three days later and the doctor told them because you had this done privately you should go back to the person who did it they're responsible and I said to him okay a lot of private hospitals in Dublin doing stents doing cardiac bypasses what if a patient came into you with a heart attack from one of those hospitals would you say the same thing to go back to the hospital yeah. It's the same thing, except that it's your face rather than your heart, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. the, the, the callous approach by some of the hospital ERs is astounding, really. Mm. You know? And I think it's because of the way that aesthetic medicine is regarded by our colleagues. And really, when you see some of what's happening out there, you couldn't really blame them. But still, at the same time, these are patients with problems. I get a lot of patients turning up with problems. A beautician may have done it. And not pass comment. It's not the patient's fault. You're dealing with a problem. We're not the sort of um, filler police. You know, we're there to okay. provide a service. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's generous of you. I I know you were also going to talk about um, delayed onset nodules um, and how you how you know yeah, one you, you, and then. You, you, sure. You've got you, you you've got to look at these um, to an extent. Uh, I suppose in two factors. Number one is when are they presenting? And I suppose number two is, what way are they presenting? So if you look first, inflammatory lesions are going to take months to appear. Okay. And if it's a lump there soon after treatment, it's likely not to be an inflammatory reaction. It's probably secondary to an allergy, product misplacement. Okay. So normally what we do is just rub those flats and hopefully they will go away. If massage was, was inappropriate and the products have been placed too superficially. I had one there just two minutes ago, actually, in oh. somebody's eyes that came in today. And then a small dose of 75 units of hyaluronidase is enough to do that. So okay. if you get hyaluronidase, let's say this is the little ampule. It's not. It happens to be. That's cortisone. Sorry.
But let's mm. say that this what what was it? The, the best thing to do is um, when you have one mil inject mm. in bacteriostatic saline, one mil, and um, so then you've got fifteen hundred units in the ampule, and if you draw it not point two mils, then you have drawn out one fifth, which is three hundred. And then if you mix that with 0.2 of bacteriostatic saline again, you have got 300 units in 0.4. So each 0.1 is 75. If you want, Alice, I can get one of the nurses uh, to bring me in the material and I can show you how to do that. I'll, I'll ask the people watching if, if, um, if, if any of you want that to ask, but I'm aware we've, we've, we've only got five hmm. minutes or so left. Uh, what, what about oh, threads? I can, I can take a bit longer. We, we had, um, oh, okay. I, I, we, we're doing threads around the other room, so don't worry. Um, yeah. Okay, we, fab. We I, I, sort of thought I, I just know the kind of pressure you're under now, so it's um, a luxury to get you to talk, because it was different, you know, a couple of months ago when everybody was around at home mm -hmm. to, uh, to chat on about it. Uh, um, uh, one, one of my other doctors is doing the threads at the moment, so, so Okay, so okay. So, and, so, and, so that's, mean, if, if it's too superficial, but then the sort of ones that people would be asking about, Alice, is the treatment of them. Yeah. <coughs> of the late onset nodules. Now, I use steroids a little more liberally than some of my colleagues, but I suppose I have the advantage of having treated hundreds of patients and known what works. So initial treatment, I tend to use a macrolide, clitoromycin. I tend to use Zitromax either or maybe doxycycline. So Zitromax are, um, usually is twice a day for about five days. And uh, the macrolides would say like Clacid would be twice a day for seven days. And then if there isn't significant improvement, I, I, I continue the antibiotics for about another two weeks. So I tend to use antibiotics first. Then if okay. that doesn't work, I use oral steroids. And if that doesn't work, I tend to inject them. Now, I find there is one company's products that seem to be continually causing problems. I don't want to mention it here. And for that okay. particular product, it usually happens in three months. Yeah, we've seen, I've seen mm. 36 in one year. Um, for those uh, products- Do, do, do uh, they know uh, this? Is, is the company aware that you're getting no, these kind of issues? They're, they're well aware of it, don't worry. They're yeah. just shutting their eyes to it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Let's let say no more. So for, Let's say no more, for sure. For that particular problem, I tend to use dexamethasone four milligrams for three days and that's enough. Now, the company and its doctors that are treating this problem with this particular product are saying to use antibiotics. I've never seen <coughs> it being related to an infection. Okay. Or why would one product continue to get infected at three months? You know? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So, it doesn't make sense. So, so those particular product now, I don't even look at them anymore because the company isn't that interested. But I do advise people just go downstairs for three days and it seems to clear up the problem. Okay. But, I mean... With all of these things, this is a lot of back and forth and attention on, on, on one patient to clear up, you know, one mess, isn't it? I mean, for, for you or any practitioner who's trying to fix complications. Oh, I tell you, I have two problems with that. <clears throat> the first thing is um, the number of non-medical people sending me things. And mm. I really almost can do nothing about it. And the second thing is some of the companies taking no responsibility. I mean, mm. one of them, I uh, think from the company said to me, they had the audacity to tell me in London, Patrick, you're making it up. You know, Ooh. I swear, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're, right. you're the one who's one handling of, it. I mean, one of the trainers, yeah. Yeah. And then um, there was another company that made a product and at the Aesthetic Wars last year, it had in its strap line, the only product not associated with inflammatory reaction Excuse me, I reported seven <laughs> giant granulomas to the medical director. That's okay. a different problem. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Dear, oh dear. Well, yeah, they, they, should, be, they should be working with you, you know, to totally. find a totally. way through yeah. this, shouldn't they? You know, see, seeing as, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing the real massive, maybe it can be brushed aside with people who don't see as many things as... Maybe it's an as American things. problem, almost like Trump, you know, keep your head buried and the whole thing will yeah. go away. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I can imagine what you mean. Should, should we talk a bit about complications with threads or should I ask you to talk about complications with threads for a bit? Yeah, sure. 
um, I find that most complication threads are either <clears throat> when, <clears throat> excuse me, that COVID is terrible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't even um, joke. Don't even joke. So um, the usual complication with threads is that they'll try and make the way to the surface. So I just take uh, a little 11 blades and get yeah. a small artery forceps, um, grip it, pull it forward, um, yeah. flush the skin and nick it, and it usually retracts back in, and, and that's okay. fine. Um, Giorgio Soleimani um, is uh, a favorite of using his granny's little hook for knitting, making a yes. neck and going down <laughs> and, and pulling them up. Um, <laughs> Handy. They, okay, so uh, but you need to you need to get them out. But the the, the complicated. So they're coming up too close to the surface. Do do they become infected or is that rare? No, they can become infected as well. Yeah. Again, I tend to use macrolides for this. But I know as Giorgio um, has used just augmentin, and I suppose that's fine. Uh, from the point of view that you know there are two different types of infections normally: bacteria okay. that use oxygen and bacteria that don't use oxygen. Okay. So when we've got something like most skin infections, bacteria do not use oxygen, like acne, for instance, um, sure. because it's coming from the inside out. So no matter how you yeah. clean your face, yeah. it's going to be there anyway. So we need things like doxycycline, trimethotrim. Okay. But I mean, these are from the outside in. So simpler antibiotics, probably like augmentin, will work. The sort of thing that would work for a sore throat would tend to work for skin infections as well. Okay. And, uh, Oh, I, I noticed that a lot of people um, are inquiring if somebody's got um, permanent fillers on their face, silicone, that type of thing, whether they should use threads or not. Most of them are contraindicated. I, I've done a few, but if you have the benefit of an ultrasound, which is becoming more and more popular, you can yes. see the location of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, okay. Because um, I, I was also wondering about, you know, the fillers that have the kind of, not barbs, but, but sort of ways of keeping them in the skin. That must make them really quite hard to pull out. So, yeah, some of them can be difficult. I had a patient who I myself put threads in five days before she got married. She slipped in a toilet in Edinburgh and there was the oh. time that it was Gore-Tex we were using. And it slipped from it. I could yeah. not get that out. So I left it in. I just put another thread in. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, at least better than I, I. I remember the the first wave of threads about fifteen years ago. You know that the, the knots would start showing through or would suddenly mm -hmm. you know let go. And um, yeah. yeah, that wasn't that wasn't fun either. But so I, you you I were saying. About... Do you? Okay. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I'm, I'm just pulling out things earlier and I have these counter threads from 2003. Okay. Yeah, those are, yeah. Yeah, those are the ones, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember you'd laugh. I was trying to write about them for the Evening Standard um, and for the health editor back then was a middle-aged man and he couldn't understand when I was describing him. I had to draw him a diagram and say on the face, you know, you go in here and those days you'd put one, two, three, four and you'd pull them up and here and here. And he, he looked absolutely appalled and he said, but you'd look like Spider-Man. And he will, yeah. apart from that, they'd, they'd be on the inside. But I, I, some did, of them. I had a German doctor on LinkedIn mm. yesterday who said to me, I'm still using your notes from the FACE conference 2005 on threads. I forgot oh. that I'd to give a lecture all the time back then, yeah. Oh, but, fantastic. But it, now you had one question that had come in before we started about um, a patient who had um who had like you said silicon injections in the past um and i mean i thought not very many people had silicon injections now unless it was like in the states that's right yes um okay because then they, they were one where... normally with silicon injections to an extent it's contraindicated but um if you can use ultrasound to see the position of them um that has been certainly done i don't have an ultrasound okay. machine myself but i know um, some doctors, Hugh Cartier in Paris, he uses one, and um, I know Peter uses one as well. And they have that question has come up a couple of times at IMCAS as well. And okay, and and then using the ultrasound, can can you creep through the layers of the skin, avoiding the, the yes. silicon? Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, a complicated. 
really complicated. But I yes. mean, <laughs> to, to people like me, <laughs> who are, I'm not a doctor for anybody who's, who's watching, I, um, I only follow all this. But uh, I dare say when you, when you know what you're doing to such an extent as you, that kind of thing becomes a, I don't know, seems a, anyway, it seems a difficult thing to avoid. The person had been asking, should they proceed and do threads in this person who had the silicon t or avoid the procedure? I mean, what, what would you advise on that? I would tend to avoid the procedure if I didn't have an ultrasound to guide me. Uh, okay. I think you've taken a chance with somebody's face. Yeah. And I don't okay. know where you stand legally if you had a problem also. Um, yeah. Because the companies would advocate that we shouldn't do it, you know? Yeah. Because it's a complex like, problem. But, yeah. Why look for trouble when you can avoid it? Totally. To totally. Um, and there's always, there's always other methodologies for tackling the particular issues, Absolutely. aren't there? Which, um, which, which might be less, less tricky. Now, um, the one about the patient who had four Pico nose threads um, and then had a lump because something was protruding, is would that fall into your previous answer about taking... Yes, okay. just again. get a okay. lid, naked, pull it out, yeah. put a little bit of tension on it, get a fine artery forceps, uh, pull it out a bit further than normally it would appear. So it's on the traction, nick it just close to the skin, and then it'll go back in itself. And your for skin sure. will grow. Okay. Clever. Okay. No, you wouldn't Thank even you. need a fish hook. For this one, just a little artery forceps and just pull it out and nick it close to the skin and the thread will withdraw itself. It'll not have butt out through the skin. Okay. Do and you, you, know, wouldn't I... a, you wouldn't need yeah. a stitch or anything it'll close itself. Okay. I didn't even know about nose threads as a thing until I was talking a couple yeah. of weeks ago with Sai Hack about it. Alice, I suppose the difference what we're dealing with there is that it's an end. Bit, yeah. The same okay. here, here. So you can sort of pull those down to the next cog. Whereas oh. if there's something coming out in the middle, it'd be different. You'd have to nick it and get a fish hook. But um, yes, noses are used. Breasts are used. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bottoms are used uh, as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, extraordinary. I just, I, I, I just never heard of it with, um, with the nose. But seeing as there are all the, all the other ways of um, adjusting the nose as well with, with, with filler and what have you. Um, sure. Now, there, there was one other question you had, you had um, from, from earlier about the forty-six-year-old female. She'd received hyaluronic acid fillers to the glabella, and it had blanched, but there was no pain. Um, and then um because pain is usually a pretty vital indication of a, an occlusion isn't it or yeah, is there not the problem with pain is because nearly all the fillers now have lidocaine in them we don't okay. tend to get pain anymore but blanching True. itself is obviously a red flag to anybody um that doctor had how had he treated it already Oh, you said the ma the management was with hyaluronidase 0.2 cc, Cialis 20 milligrams the first day and warm compresses. The second day she received nitroglycerin patch on the zone and after and that complaints of headache and the skin was pigmented. Okay, yeah. The, 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 that's a question under command. I suppose the answer to that was the doctor had not given enough hyaluronidase. It was a straightforward ah. velar sort of area. So... Um, uh, he had given just not 0.2, I'm not even sure what that means, not 0.2 of a CC probably is 300 if it's coming from a 1500 units. So okay. I mean, we normally would, the bell goes downhill very fast. And um, we normally would give 750 to 1500 units in the first, um, I suppose, 30 minutes to 60 minutes and repeat that every hour um, and I haven't seen any problems with giving people up to 4,000 units in a day and bring them back tomorrow. But okay. I mean, they all recover um, yeah. with hyaluronidase. And certainly yeah. the bad ones I tend to put into um, the um, hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, and then probably one, one more question I can let you go unless, um, unless there's more things you want to say. Which is, do you believe in biofilm? And perhaps for those who don't know, can you uh, explain what biofilm yeah. is? And... I, I met Emer. Could you get durability just to bring me in a uh, hyaluronidase full ampule bacteriostatic and a Botox needle, please? 
the hell you're on this ampule? Should we give me one? We can get a new one. Well, get one out of the fridge. Yeah, thanks. A Botox needle and a, a bacteriostatic saline. Thank you. Yeah. It's no harm Fantastic. to see that because once you see it, it's, yeah. it's easy to do. Okay, because well, thank you. That's fine. Uh, I know that's, that's fine. Yes, in terms of biofilm, people say now that they don't exist. I certainly have seen them. They probably were over-reported with a slightly different thing. And when I seen them, I tended to treat them also for mycobacteria. So I over-treat them because if you send in a culture and sensitivity and nothing comes back and you know it's infected, there is a risk of mycobacterium there. There was one clinic in Glasgow that had three and the water was tested in their fridge and there was mycobacterium in it. So mycobacterium is present in water still, even though it reminds us of the old days of tuberculosis when <laughs> mycobacterium was a, a big problem. But it just means tuberculosis took a long time to treat. I mean, during the war, 1943, Britain already had penicillin it took mm -hmm. us to the 1950s, almost 1957, before, you know, the use of streptomycin particularly, but also rimpampicin could be used. And the reason was that the bacteria walled itself off. So uh, thank you for that. We tend to get the same problem. Um, if oh, Thanks, Deborah. Do you want to join in here? Uh, Deborah, say hi. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, thank so, you. Just, just so we, 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 thank you. Just so we know this. So this is fifteen hundred units, okay? okay. And if we um, break this and take bacteriostatic saline, and from bacteriostatic saline, just draw one mil. And this is a protocol that I wrote up, but it's so easy to remember. And if you feel that the, the hyaluronic is a bit sore, you can use lidocaine with it. Don't use lidocaine adrenaline if the patient's got a ischemic problem, but normally this is not sore. If you inject, I suppose, um, saline to somebody, it's very sore, but bacteriostatic isn't. So you mix that into that, and you get then the solution, I suppose, just like that. So yeah. if you draw out from that, not 0.2 mils, okay, not 0.2 mils has one fifth, which is 300 units. Yeah. And then if you go back to your bacteriostatic, I know that I've got hyaluronidase in this. I know this yeah. bacteriostatic. So, I mean, I'll not, but just for the sake of demonstration, if I draw out another not 0.2, yeah. That means that each not point one has got 75 units. Okay. So 75 units is your working basic unit. Obviously, you can make it up the same way, not point five and not point five of this. And if you, you've got 750 units then, and so you've got 10 75s. So you've got somebody with a compromised vascular occlusion, bang, bang, bang. There's enough in that for, with one mil, for um, 750 units, which is fine, you know? Okay. So it's very straightforward because people do get confused. What do we use? How much do we use? You know, they're simple yeah. measurements. Okay, fantastic. Patrick, thank you so much. And particularly for that, for that demonstration, I think that will help a lot of people with the, um, you know, the remembering it. Um, sure. And so I think I'll, I'll let you go now unless there's anything else you particularly want to add so you can get back in and see what they're doing with the threads. Um, somebody had asked, um, how do you prevent, I suppose, complications happening? Yep. And um, most of it is fairly straightforward. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, you clean the area, you take a medical history, you um, obviously, in terms of medical history, you're looking for autoimmune diseases, blah, blah, blah. Then you get an informed consent. So these are all important things before you do anything, you know? Then the choice of filler, um, and I'd never get involved. That's a personal thing, what people want to do, but you know, some fillers uh, contain, uh, have more problems than others. And then I suppose the best doctors are ones that are trained, that know their anatomy and all the rest, but an even better doctor is somebody who has experience because you can never really beat that. So you have to know your facial anatomy well, 
And remember, it's a three-dimensional, not a two-dimensional model. Yeah. So you could easily know where it is, but the artery could be higher in the skin or lower in the skin for other people. So it may not be your fault. The patient themselves could have just an artery in the wrong place. And um, then obviously, um, whenever you have a problem, um, immediately most are reversible with how you run it is. Myself or many other mentors are on the end of a phone. If you've got a problem, you can FaceTime. And, you know, and that can give you confidence as well with a patient because I know I've worked alone on my own and it's a lonely place to be if you run into a problem. And who do you turn to? You turn to the hospital and usually they don't want to know. You turn to one of your colleagues and you're afraid to say anything because, oh, look, at you messed up, you know. And um, yeah. so, you know, have a mentor, have somebody you can turn to. And um, usually the person, if they get involved in the FaceTime you know, conversation or WhatsApp or whatever, they're not going to turn around and say, oh my God, what did you do, you know? They're right. going to take the patient through it and respect the doctor has a problem. And um, then, as I say, if you have an impending blindness, it's very easy, just, you know, Up put there, a yeah. that, that would be enough there almost, you know? And if you're brave yeah. enough, well, you shouldn't even have to be brave enough, you can go down the little foramen and yeah. I, 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 I never had a problem, yeah. For sure. But uh, as you say, I, I mean, from what I hear, more people seem to be being a bit more open to talk about complications mm. because, you know, all, all you top guys talk about it very openly about the fact mm. that it can happen to anyone. You know, those arteries wiggle around all over the place, you know, don't they? They're not where the textbook necessarily says they should be. So, and the more discussion there is of it, surely then there would be less blame and nobody nobody really if they know their stuff can sit there and say oh i've never had one of these things mm. happen as if I they're know. too good for it because you yes. know it does it does happen um of course but yeah yeah fantastic but more education more training more experience i mean those are all the ways the ways forward aren't they absolutely yeah fantastic well Patrick, thank you Go on, go on. I was Sorry. Thinking maybe also to keep a limitation on who's allowed to inject. But ah, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. that would be good, wouldn't it? But um, for all the pressure that pops up here from time to time, I don't see the government getting um, getting excited and getting behind that in the near future. W would you? Well, I noticed Sharon Bennett and John Curran have been doing great things for us with the sort of um, parliamentary all-party groups but listening to some of the videos on that, my God, I didn't realize it was so bad. I think yeah. we need a royal commission because yeah. a lot of the people seem to be paid by lobbyists to ah. push a certain case. And the beauticians have paid, from what I hear, 27,000 to the lobbyists to um, mitigate against medical people. And um, that's shocking, you know? The things I didn't know that, yeah. Oh, well, you know, things should be done for the right ethical and moral reasons. Yeah. Not because somebody, you know, sort of um, pays some money to shout louder, you know. Mm. Well, on which note, Patrick, I'll okay, say so thank you very much indeed. And Thanks I hope to see you for real one day. And uh, have a yeah, good weekend. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye-bye now.